All right, all good? You good? All right. What's going on, Warrior? Jeff Anderson here, Executive Director of Warlife.com and the Warrior Life Academy. So 36-year-old Kelly Heron was out jogging on a Seattle, Washington trail, and she quickly jumped into a nearby public restroom to take a bathroom break. After she finished up and she began drying her hands near the sink, she suddenly felt that something wasn't quite right. Now, originally she thought that she was alone in the restroom, but something gave her pause, and so she stopped to look over to where she sensed that there was a presence in the room. Now, that's when Gary Steiner who was a 40-year-old registered sex offender, lunged out from behind one of the bathroom stall doors. Now, Steiner had been hiding there quietly in the women's bathroom, waiting for his opportunity to attack and rape again. And Kelly was his next victim. And catching her off guard, he immediately took Kelly to the floor and began punching her into submission with his fists. Now, Kelly did everything that she could to fight back, even crawling on her back into one of the bathroom stalls and trying to kick the door shut with her feet. But Steiner did not give up. He quickly jumped into the next stall and crawled under the partition to corner Kelly in that tight space, repeatedly beating her in the face. Now, as much as Kelly fought back, the bigger, stronger man was too much for her. And she started to feel like she was going to black out and go unconscious. That's when Kelly had what she described as a moment of clarity. And she said to herself, this doesn't have to be a fair fight. So she started to claw away at his face, striking and gouging him over and over again like she was a possessed demon, telling herself to never give up. And Kelly's determination and her tactics worked. She was able to incapacitate Steiner enough to break free and run out of the bathroom and she grabbed a nearby pedestrian who was able to help Kelly lock the bathroom door from the outside using a carabiner until the police came to haul Steiner away. Now Kelly was lucky that day, but more than luck, she was a warrior. She decided she was not going to be a victim. And her story and how she fought back has some great lessons in here about what it really takes to survive and even win a violent attack by somebody who is bigger and stronger than you. In fact, in our Warrior Life Academy, uh, we just finished up our fast class training for defeating larger attackers, and one of the modules was all about cheap shots and dirty tricks. And Kelly's story is a great example of the core concept of this module because no matter what anyone tells you, size does matter. That's why there's a disparity of force clause here in, when it comes to a lethal self-defense argument for court, because we know that size matters. And when you're facing an attacker who is bigger and stronger than you, it's not a fair fight. So, as Kelly Heron finally came to realize, you don't have to fight fair. Now, frankly, this is kind of like a guy thing. It's something that I think is instilled in us since we were young by our fathers and by the other kids on the playground who are like cheering on anybody that's gonna get into a scrap. And for any guy who's ever been in one of those scraps when you were younger, or maybe you were even just taught this by your father, the one thing you do not want to be accused of, in fact, it's even worse than losing the fight, is fighting like a girl. Now, as we've gotten older and the stakes of an attack get much higher when it's not just some playground scrap, and instead you're facing a 300 pound thug in some parking lot who's pummeling you into the pavement for taking his spot, well, Fighting like a girl may be exactly what saves your life. In fact, in this week's show, I wanna share with you five girly-inspired self-defense techniques that really work in real fights, no matter how much bigger and stronger your attacker is. And, and this makes sense, right? Like, I mean, most women have already overcome that mental hurdle that I think a lot of us guys fall prey to because they have this natural assumption that if they're attacked by a man, that they're not going to be able to just trade punch for punch and hope to survive. They have to do something different. So this changes the mission of looking for something that's practical and will really help them survive a real attack. Now, unfortunately, most martial arts that are out there, like it or not, are based on strength. You know, how to punch strong, how to kick strong. Uh, like, that's what, they're built around power. But if you're relying solely on strength and power to win a fight, then, this is absolutely, when you're fighting against somebody who is bigger and stronger than you, is going to be a failing strategy because it's based upon strength and power. So let's jump into these five girly principles that could just be the things that get you home alive in a real attack. And the first one is probably one of the most 
debated fight moves ever. And that is striking or kicking to the groin. Now, for the most part, I have to say, like, women don't have this mental block because they're taught just kick the guy in the balls. This is debated because, not because it's a girly move, but because whether or not it's truly effective. Because a determined attacker, I mean, ask any guy that's ever been, you know, fallen off of his bike and hit that, that bar in the middle, like, and just came down on your nads, and it just, it hurts like hell. Or ever, anybody that's ever been, like, sack-tapped, or just, like, somebody just punches you in the nuts. Like, it happens. We've all been there as guys. And I know works for girls, too, to some extent, I'm sure. But it's debatable whether it is a true fight ender or not. But one thing I can tell you is that it does hurt. And so that might be all that you need in order to give yourself some space to be able to change the, the tide of the battle just with being able to strike somebody in the groin, your attacker, I mean, there's no, there's no exercise machine at the gym that's gonna help him build up his balls. So they are what they are, they're easy to get to, they're easy to strike, whether it's a kick or, or anything else. The challenge becomes with what kind of an effect it's actually going to have. Because when the adrenaline's pumping and this person, you guys are, he's attacking you and you're fighting back, then of course that adrenaline is going to dull some of that pain. So is it a fight ender? No, it is absolutely not. It's considered a girly move, but it actually does have a purpose when it comes to fighting. The problem is the mental block that we guys have with it's not the right manly thing to do even though it is absolutely 100% taught in martial arts classes. Like, it is a martial arts target. But still, as guys growing up, we are often instilled with this, this hurdle of getting past this thing where it's not a fair fight. It's not manly to strike somebody in the groin. Well, I beg to differ. What we're talking about here is just what Kelly went through. Because I just had this conversation with um, Masad Ayub this, this, this past weekend. We were talking about it because I know what happens. I've seen enough gang fights in my security work and in, in, in working in some pretty seedy places in New Mexico. Um, when gangs attack, when somebody goes unconscious, that doesn't mean the fight's over. A lot of guys, especially in gangs, other people will jump in there and they'll start pounding away or kicking this person. It's a cowardly act, but it is absolutely one that if you go unconscious, you are, you are potentially in a life-threatening situation right there, all right? So you've got to get over that mental hurdle about fighting fair and something being manly or girly. That's the first hurdle in all of this. So a strike or kick to the groin is absolutely on that whole, it, it, it's, it's on the menu, it's on the menu, all right? All right, the second one here is probably the most girly move of all time, and that's pulling hair. If you ever see a cat fight, usually what ends up happening is they're trying to punch away at each other is they end up grabbing each other's hair with their hands and just trying to like haul each other around. A little bit harder with a guy because a lot of guys don't wear their hair long. Maybe there's not much to grab onto there. But pulling hair is absolutely a great technique for close quarters combat. So we're gonna assume that, the, that your attacker does have hair and you are able to grab to it. Now there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. But the reason why this works is because where the head goes, the body follows. And especially when you are defending against somebody who is bigger and stronger than you, where they draw their power from is their balance. In other words, if they have a solid structure, if they've got a good foothold, if they've got a good enough stance, they're going to use their strength, their size, their power to strike you as hard as they possibly can. But in order to be able to do that, anybody needs to have a proper stance in order to deliver any kind of power. Now, every time that you touch your attacker, every time that you strike them, you should be either knocking them out, it should be like a, almost like a death blow, something that can really like take them out of the fight. You need to, you can't waste any punches in a real attack. And so you either need to be knocking them out or it, it might be a kill shot if, it, if it's justified, or you wanna create some sort of chaos in, in their body, something that is involuntary, something that forces their 
central nervous system to shut down. Or it could be taking their balance because they're not able to launch an attack. The brain thinks defensively when we're off balance because the brain senses your, your body in, in space. And so it is trying to recover. It's trying to make sure that you don't land on your head and, and kill yourself. So you can't think offensively and defensively at the same time there. So if you take somebody's balance off, their brain is gonna be short-circuited, even if it's just temporary. And they're not able to launch an attack from there. So where the head goes, the body is gonna follow. So if you take the head off of the center line, you place them off balance. And one of the easiest ways to do that, even with somebody that is bigger and stronger than you, is with pulling the hair. Now, I said that there was a right way and a wrong way to do this. So you can demonstrate this yourself. Have somebody that you know go ahead and grab you on the top of your head, on the crown of your head, and pull. You'll notice that your muscles are able to use that a little bit better because it's, it's focusing on the center of your head that you're able to use your muscles to be able to hold back and, and provide some tension and, and some, some, uh, some resistance there for them. The other thing you'll notice is that it really doesn't hurt all that much. The right way to pull somebody's hair is going to be either from the side or the back, preferably from the side, by reaching around the back of their head. So if you are fighting with somebody, especially if you are in close quarters combat, this is where this is why a lot of the fights go to the ground because most people don't know how to fight in, cl in extreme close quarters. They know from the haymaker zone, but that's about it. So when you find yourself in a grappling situation uh, where somebody just wants to grab onto you or whatever, if you can get around to the back of their head, you just reach around to the back of their head and grab on the the side of the hair on the side of the head that is opposite of your grabbing arm. So if I'm reaching around with my, with my left hand, uh, it's, I'm grabbing their left side of their head. Now the reason for this is because it is easier for you to pull. You'll have more strength in being able to pull a weight towards you. So if I have my hand grabbed into his hair on, the, on his left side with my left arm, when I pull, I'm essentially rotating his head. I'm, I'm putting him into exorcist mode. He's got a whole total Linda Blair thing happening here. And his head is gonna spin around. And when that happens and I pull there and I pull down, I can take this person down to the ground. I can turn him around. It gives me other options for being able to, if I wanna put him in a choke hold or if I wanna take him out at the knees underneath and just like hit him in the, like knock him out from the back. It gives me options. Now, you don't have to reach around to the back of the head. You can go to the side as well. You can just grab on the same side, so on his right side of his head, and I've got my, my left hand, I can take it there, and I can just bring it down to the ground. Now, the pain factor here might not be all that strong because of the adrenaline that's flowing there, but the most important part of this is taking them off balance. And the good thing about this move is that it also works when you have somebody on top of you and it's a ground fight. If you can reach up to their body or climb your way up just by grabbing onto their clothes and just basically climbing your way up, literally up their, up their body and reaching around the back of their head and grabbing the hair and twisting it around and Linda Blairing them, then you can essentially take them off of you if they're in that mount position, they're on top of you there. All right, so pulling hair, yep, that's on the menu. That's on the close quarters combat menu, all right? All right, so girly move number three is biting. Again, if you tried this in the schoolyard, you'd, you'd probably be teased all the way through graduation, right? But in a real fight, biting is absolutely something that people have learned by losing fights, that it is something that really does work. Some examples of that would be uh, Mike Tyson, who grew up a scrapper. He grew up street fighting. Now, you can say that, I mean, he's a big, powerful man, probably didn't have to use this stuff, but he understands on a very, on a very programmed level that when he was getting, he was, felt like he was losing that fight or losing that, that battle of the fight with, uh, I believe it was uh, Vander Holyfield, what did he do? He bit his ear off. And you can see the sheer shock and horror of, of being bitten by Holyfield. I mean, just, he, he just, just reached away and it's like bro broke up the fight right then and there. The same thing happens in real attacks. Now there's like a, I think it's like a felony fight or something like that. There's one that we used in the academy for analysis of real street fights where 
a guy that had a prison had, had been in prison and became known in prison because he was getting his ass handed to him and bit this guy's nose off in prison and that was what he became known for this guy became it, it was just like an insane guy right and you can see in this felony fight too up against this guy that once he finally got the other guy down to the ground he resorted to biting the guy bit right into his cheek and the other guy who was locked in battle with him instantly gave up so again this is one of those moves that works really well. I'm not saying like you're going to be in kicking range and all of a sudden you're going to you're going to run in and just like bite the guy's nose or anything. But what I am saying that when you are in a situation where somebody might have you in a headlock or in a you're ground fighting and they're going to choke you out or you just can't move. I mean, being on the ground is the worst place you can be because now those cowards that are standing around watching like the guy's buddies or whatever, they can come in and just start stomping away at you. You need to get off the ground by whatever means necessary. And biting is one of those things. So as I saw and we analyzed in, the, in this felony fight, you might, even if it's in the side of them or whatever, just sink your teeth in, rip off flesh, just start ripping off pieces of flesh. If it is a situation like that one, the sheer shock and horror that that person is going to experience, it's, it's primal. It is primal. And it should get them off of you. So, biting, yep, that's on the menu also. Like, literally on the menu, I guess, right? Okay. So, girly move number four is actually a girly system. And it's a martial arts system. It's a, it's a kung fu system. It's actually one of the, the newer kung fu systems that are traditional martial arts, and that's Wing Chun. Now, it's debatable about what the history is about the birth of Wing Chun, but according to Ip Man, who is really kind of like the biggest legend when it comes to, when it comes to the, the lineage of Wing Chun as a martial art, was that this was created by a, a woman nun, uh, Ying Mui, who was fleeing a Shaolin temple. She was one of, I think, five of the, the five elders that, that were able to escape from, from that Shaolin temple. And she developed this system. Now, again, if you are a woman realizing that most men are going to have more muscle than you, they're going to be bigger, they're going to be stronger than you, you ha as I said before, you have to, it changes the mission. You have to go looking for a better way, a smarter way of fighting. And that's what Wing Chun is. Now you will go out onto YouTube and you will see videos that will explain why Wing Chun is absolutely, will never work in a real fight. First of all, I don't believe that about any martial art. I don't care what it is. I don't care, I don't care if it is Taekwondo, which we we'll mostly see as like a sport martial art. I don't care. Like whatever, whatever lucky blow you get in or if you can, if you can do a triple back flip monkey dragon kick and that's the one thing you can pull off in a real fight, then who am I to say that that doesn't work, right? Like, you can't say that. So Wing Chun absolutely has some amazing aspects of it that are based upon dealing with a bigger, stronger attacker by using their energy against them, by not focusing in on I have to punch harder or kick harder than the guy that's in front of me. Now, one of the concepts that they use a lot, and it is a very, what I, one of the things I like a lot about it is that it is designed for extreme close quarters, which is how most fights, they're either going to end up that way if they don't start out that way. So they use a lot of elbows. They do use punching and things like that, but their kicks are very, they're very low, very powerful. They work on the joints. There's a lot in the Wing Chun system. But one of the things that I like about the training of Wing Chun is sticky hands training. So sticky hands training is a series of drills and, and movements that you perform with another training partner. And it's just a, it's a movement drill, but it's also a sense and feeling drill. Because if you can, if you have contact with your attacker, and it's a very, it's not like you're not sparring, you're not punching at each other, but there are different moves. And I'm, I am not a Wing Chun master, I will tell you right now. Um, it is something I finally live in an area where I can get the training and it, that's, that's a, that is in my future here because I wanna learn these extreme close quarter tactics that I can apply to the other things that I know. And so the, with the sticky hands, it really, it's like your hands are, and arms are stuck to one another with the other, with the other attacker. So as you're moving around, you, with these drills, you get to sense 
what the other person's movement is going to be. And you instinctively program into your brain how you're going to respond to them so that it happens without you even having to think about it. Now, I have not taken, uh, I've taken Wing Chun in classes before, but not the actual whole system. But I can say that in my very first martial arts, which was, which was a Shaolin Kung Fu style, Pangai Noon, one of the drills that we did was a version of sticky hands. It was like a free form version of sticky hands. And you can do this yourself. I think this is especially, it, it works especially well because trying to find, like ask your neighbor to come over to the, to your garage and like, hey, you wanna practice some martial arts? Well, what are you gonna do, spar? Like, what are you going to do there? It, in order to find somebody that really is going to work with you as a training partner, like it needs to be safe. You know, and nobody wants to feel intimidated or anything like that. Well, this is a very simple drill that you can do that's very effective for close quarters combat, and it's not intimidating. And essentially, all it is, and this is what we did with um, with with our with my instruction with Pangai Noon, is you are just free fighting in slow motion, but just with your hands and arms touching each other. So you're looking for entries. So this person might be. You're just gonna move against each other. So sometimes you'll be pushing, you'll feel them push against you, and you'll be able to sense where you can move their, their hand, their arm, or also move yourself out of the way so that you're not where that blow would have been. Again, this happens in very, not super slow motion, but it's just, it's just fast enough that you're being somewhat, like you could amp it up if you wanted to, but it's realistic in that it's not so slow that you know it's just like it's it's just not realistic if that's that's the best way to put it but what the one thing i really like about this also another little tip that you can add to this is to put a blindfold on so both of you be blindfolded because then you really do have to know what your your spacing is um, know where you you can't see where the other strike is coming from you really do have to use your your perception of their movement and that's going to help elevate that that skill for you to be able to do that. Now, the other thing that you can do with this is as you're going through this, you're gonna start to realize where you do have an opening, where you're able to trap an arm, and the other one can come up and go around the back of the head and grab the hair and spin it around. You're gonna find where those openings are and you're gonna get used to them feeling how you can enter in and do more damage to your attacker. You're also gonna be able to know when you might be able to trap or if you're able to push off to the side, now I can get to another weapon. I can get to a knife, I can get to a gun if, it's, if I'm legally justified for any of these. So it's not just for martial arts, if you will. This is really an entry drill and also being able to get enough space to be able to counter with another weapon, okay? All right, the, the fifth and final girly move here is actually one that was developed for soldiers in World War II, but was transformed into being a very effective skill for self-defense for women also. And that was created by Lieutenant Colonel William Fairbairn. W.E. Fairbairn, legend in World War II combatives. Some would say like the inventor of World War II combatives. And originally, this technique was used as a one-handed, what he called the chin jab. And so with one hand, it's just basically coming up underneath the soldiers or the attacker, the enemy's chin, and being able to pop that chin up as hard as you can to be able to knock them off balance and take them back. Now, this can be a knockout blow. This could potentially knock somebody out. It's one of the ways. Like that's why an uppercut works so well because when you, if somebody were to punch up underneath the chin, snaps the neck back, and uh, causes the causes the cause the person to short circuit and, and black out. So this could potentially be a knockout move just with that single hand underneath there. So right? I mean, I don't like. I tell people don't punch anyway. Use your use your the palm of your hand. So get underneath there, and that's it. But Fairbairn also transformed this to be able, and it was very powerful to be used by women by using just two hands. And this is one of my, one of the moves that I put as my primary move, really in the Defeat Larger Attackers 
uh, training because I've used this thing in real fights and it works like magic. Every single time I've been able to get that center line there, which is another Wing Chun concept, is, is owning that center line, it comes in underneath their radar because most people, especially if they're bigger and stronger, are gonna be wailing away from the outside with these haymaker punches, right? That's where their power is. That's where they know how to do that. That's leaving them wide open on the center line here. So rather than using just one hand, you wanna put your hands together like meet them at the palm right near where your wrist is there. You can even interlock your thumbs if you want to. It's not necessary. But from here, all you have to do is just come up the center line and just put it underneath their chin and take their head right off their shoulders. Now that is going to take away their balance. It is going to potentially knock them out. And that's gonna allow you to either follow up with another attack or get to a weapon or to get the hell out of there. So this is extremely effective, all right? Um, and very, very simple, doesn't even take any real practice at all to be able to do it. But just coming up underneath that chin is going to be one of the easiest things that you can possibly do. It can be done even from without getting into a stance or anything like that. You are just there, the person isn't backing down, you suddenly explode. And the good thing about this, no matter how big and strong that they are, is that it is your entire body, your entire strength, your system pulling from the ground with that stance just with your, with your feet, up through your arms, up through your torso, it is my entire body coming up underneath that chin and all he's got is everything from his neck up. Now it doesn't matter how big and strong he is, I've got the power advantage at that point. All right, so the double-handed chin jab, originally pioneered by William Fairbairn, definitely on the menu. All right. All right. So those are five girly moves that you can use in a real fight. I'm giving you permission. Go ahead and go ahead and be and fight like a woman. All right. But I want to find out from you. What are some other techniques that don't require strength and power and size to be able to defeat somebody who is bigger and stronger than you in a real attack? I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead. If you're watching this on a stream on one of our face like our Facebook page or Instagram or or YouTube, please go ahead and leave a comment there. Or if you're listening to this as part of our podcast, you can go to warlifepodcast.com and that'll take you to a special section over on our website where we have our, where we have all of our our podcasts leading up. I'd love to get your comments in the, uh, the in the, the feedback column there. So please go ahead and do that now. All right. And until our next show, this is Jeff Anderson saying, "Live like a warrior."